That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Fire Island, the third film directed by Andrew Ahn, which uh, is a Fox Searchlight production that will be uh, premiering on Hulu uh, June 3rd, 2022, just in time for Pride Month. Do you know Andrew's other films? Uh, yes. Uh, Spa Night, which I believe I reviewed at Sundance back oh, in 2016. Yes. And then we reviewed his second film, Driveways. Uh, starring Hong Chow and uh, Brian Dennehy, and I might have oh. been his last film. Yes, mm -hmm. I actually remember those. Mm -hmm. I did enjoy this film. Same. The basic story, it's about a group of friends. Mm -hmm. The two main friends are played by Bowen Yang and Joel Kim Booster. Who wrote it? Bowen Yang wrote it. No, Joel Kim Booster Joel wrote Kim it. Booster wrote it, okay. <laughs> So this group of, like, diverse group of friends were told to go to Fire Island every year, which is like that gay-ass island off of New York City somewhere. I've never been. But it's akin to, like, Provincetown or Palm Springs or... Okay. We're told to go every year, this group of friends. Bowen Yang's character has sort of uh, distanced himself from the group because he moved to San Francisco for a job. So... They, the film opens basically with them taking the ferry to Fire Island. There is an opening scene we can talk about, but they make their way there. And it's clear Bowen Yang's character feels out of place. Like, he is acknowledging that this environment, which is pre predominantly comprised of, like, gay white guys who are super fit and always shirtless and partying, that, he's, that, that this is not the place for him. But it's clear that he and... Joel Kim Booster's characters... Noah. Are, Noah and Howie. ...are very close. Mm -hmm. So, the main storyline of the movie is that Joel wants to get Bowen laid. Mm -hmm. So, he wants his friend to have sex. So, like, the first or second day, Bowen meets a character named Charlie. Mm -hmm. This, like, attractive white guy who's rich. He's a pediatrician. He's there with his rich, snobby friends in this beautiful mansion. And it's very clear, like, that Bowen and his crew don't fit in with the rich white guys. Although one of the friends is not white, a lawyer named Will. Mm -hmm. We're told, we're not told, a character asks if he's Filipino, but he's like a person of color. Uh, I think the character named Cooper said he's half white. Sure. Okay. <sighs> Essentially, well, to wrap it up, Bowen's character sort of like falls for this pediatrician guy. They have their ups and downs, but ultimately they connect. Mm -hmm. Conversely, Joel Kim Booster's character has this antagonistic relationship with Will the lawyer. Mm -hmm. But then it sort of flips towards the end where they're like, they clearly have an attraction. But there really are no like loose ends to tie because they just sort of, proceed like we're going to get to know each other all like Bowen and Joel to their little two men the end so some important plot points are this group of friends they establish like they don't have a lot of money and it's mostly rich gays or people who are glomming on to rich gays who go to Fire Island but this group of friends they stay with an older lesbian played by Margaret Cho named Aaron and she has money because she won a settlement after chewing like some glass at like an olive garden. <laughs> so she used that money to buy this house. But we're told that she has not made good financial choices and is forced to sell her house on Fire Island. So effectively, this will be this group's last summer. The last hurrah. Mm -hmm. Last hurrah. So they're all sort of desperate to have a good time. So it clearly it's... Um, in the very beginning, the opening sequence and... Uh, Noah, Joel Kim Booster's character, is uh, periodically narrating. Uh, he grabs a, a book, and the next book in the stack is Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And this is a film that is uh, kind of making this a contemporary queer version of Jane Austen. Uh, and I would say very heavily mixed in with something like Larry Kramer's book, F Slur. <laughs> mm. uh, I really enjoyed the humor. Uh, it, the, this film is funny, but it's not so like audacious that it takes away from the messaging. And there's a lot to talk about with mm -hmm. this story. I don't even think we'll have time to talk about it all. We talked about it at length after we watched it, which is always a good sign. 
So well, it stirs a lot of feelings being yes. being queer men that uh, you know have straddled kind of different <laughs> generational divides as well. So when the group makes their way to Fire Island, they're on this ferry and they have a moment as they approach Fire Island. Pun intended. <laughs> where they like all the gay men on the boat start to take their shirts off. Mm -hmm. And then there's commentary on like, why are we adopting these like standards that aren't healthy? And Well, these social hierarchies that are very specific to gay culture. Yeah. So what I really appreciate is that the story is not shying away from sort of the crunchier, nasty bits of the community. Mm -hmm. um, I do think where, so I did really like this movie and I would give it a nice score, but the reason I wouldn't give it like an excellent score is I do think it misses some opportunities to call out some shit that it brings up. Yes, yes, but but doesn't take it to task. And I think, especially regarding this, the romance between uh, James Scully's Charlie uh, and Bo and Yang's Howie. Because Charlie has a group of friends, some of whom are vile. Yeah, to say the least, yeah. And, the you know, Bowen and this Charlie character have ups and downs. The biggest down in you know after only being with each other for like three days <laughs> is charlie sees his ex or the ex like flies into fire island like unexpectedly and charlie reconnects with him and we see this ex say some pretty ridiculous like racist shit and we see charlie kind of go like oh gosh but it's not enough for him to like say i'd want to distance myself from you and then ultimately charlie and bowen connect because charlie does profess his love in a kind of funny scene where he's like, oh, I went too far. Mm -hmm. I, I just really like you. But I guess for me, I needed Bowen to like take him to task. Like I need to be assured that you are not going to associate with people like that. And you need to explain to me that you understand why what your friend said is some bullshit before we can continue. So I think that the story missed the mark on that point. Well, because the uh, handful of white characters that we do see uh, are either predatorial as is one character uh, that's called a, a rice queen and we can uh, revisit that sequence as well uh, but also charlie who is this sweet white person who is completely oblivious or so callous that he doesn't realize that by bringing uh howie's friends over to his this this you know palatial estate clearly they're not going to mix well and he's, he's compromising them. So I don't know what's worse, that he's oblivious or he's callous. But, but you know, now that you're saying that, I feel like we've been put in many situations where people invite us to social things where it's like... They don't clear, leave the room, yeah. They, yeah, they're not curating an appropriate audience. They're, they're not reading the room. So it, it did feel very authentic that Charlie's character would be so oblivious to the fact that his stuck-up-ass friends would not welcome his new group of friends... <laughs> Well, into this environment. Especially because how they're behaving around uh, Howie's friends when they're saying, when they're watching the sunset in the beginning. Like they clearly seem irritated, they're checked out. Uh, There's a really cute scene the first day that Bowen meets Charlie. He's trying to do everything he can, while well, Joel Kim Booster's character is trying to do everything he can to keep the two together. So they go to watch the sunset. And there's a cute scene where Bowen and his friends are counting down the sunset, like from 10. Mm -hmm. but obviously the sun's not moving that fast mm -hmm. so they're kind of like playing with the numbers I thought it was a really cute it's scene sweet, yeah. and then you see Charlie and his friends being sort of awkward like this is lame like is this what poor people do yeah and then Charlie keeps saying things like, I've never met people like you before yeah and it's just like but again I've you know in my younger days dated white men who seem so oblivious to the fact that my life and my lifestyle as a person of color would not be the same as theirs, mm -hmm. that it did read true to yes, me yes. that Charlie would be so oblivious. What wouldn't, what, what didn't read true is if I end up dating Charlie, oh, you need to write down what we learned from this experience so we don't duplicate this shit again. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, and then who's the other uh, white character that's the OnlyFans? Uh... Okay, so Will, the lawyer, who... Oh my God, I couldn't stand that character. But when we first meet him, um, he's kind of a dick to Bowen's friend group. Mm -hmm. And Joel Kim Booster's character meets Noah. This, this super hot white guy in a grocery store and then they sort of like connect. And then Will sees this white guy and immediately is turned off. So of course, as the audience, we're like, they have a history. 
And I think another misstep of the storytelling is that they're dangling this carrot regarding this hot white guy, mm -hmm. like that he's this insidious person and he can't be trusted, to the point where, and you explained to me, I have read Pride and Prejudice, I don't remember, but you said this is very Jane Austen, that how Will writes a letter. How uh, <laughs> you have to articulate, uh, how you have to maneuver in this this. Uh, these social hierarchies, I think, is what the point of this sure. film was trying to do. But ultimately, because Will is doing a really shitty job communicating, what is the problem with this man that we should stay away from him? Mm -hmm. We find out that the problem is this man, this hot white guy, has a history of having sex with people and recording it without their consent and then putting these videos on the interwebs. And we when we find out prior to that that he has an OnlyFans page... So I feel like the reveal of what's so awful about him is kind of a letdown. He's just kind of a, I mean, he's a predator, but it's like, okay, the one friend who ends up falling victim to him was also high on like Luke, G. Luke. And, you know, and it admits he wanted to have sex with him. He just don't, doesn't remember ever saying he, he just misconstrued it. He thought it was romantic. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was a little bit of a misstep. But yes, that character and the way Will communicates it I understand maybe as a reference to the writings of Jane Austen, but I think in the in the context of 2022 homosexuals on Fire Island and with technology, it just seemed... I don't think they're that subdued. Laborious, yeah. 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 And also, yeah, with gay men, it's like two versions. It's like, we're going to spill the tea, tell everyone's business, I'm going to talk about every little thing about you and what you did in your body, or I'm going to keep secrets. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things y'all are good at. But, like, to write letters alluding to... That, that just seemed kind of silly. Um, when we first go to the fancy beach house where Charlie is with all his fancy friends, um, I felt that. Mm -hmm. I felt like, oh, when you're out of place and everyone looks at you like you're trash and it's like everything I can muster to remind myself that I'm not trash and I'm not a piece of shit. And just because you people don't want me here doesn't mean that I have no value. And then the understanding that I need to know that this is not the place for me either. Right, right. And and knowing and that and that's okay. And, and that's okay. And you don't have to give those people your time. But right. also that scene is kind of uh, you know, a double edged sword as well in showing that your friend group, if you look at them in a certain light, could also be messy. And yes, it's also in that scene where we see like a couple of the friends are like on the hot you know, they're they're a hot mess express. Yes. So I also related to that a lot too, like having friends and we can also get into even, I think this story is so great because it delves into all of the facets relating to like gay men of a particular age and not to be shady, but when Bowen Yang's character says he's only 30, I was like, I thought these guys were like in their late thirties or early forties, but so, okay, they're all 30 maybe. So that's me, you know, 15, 13 years ago. I remember being like that group of friends or having a group of friends like that who were not particularly close, but then we have these like experiences that should bond us. Mm -hmm. And they do to a degree. And they but... do to a degree. But then like you mentioned, it's like seeing them in a different light and realizing like, maybe, maybe we don't really have a connection. We just do. What I was going to say is we engage in these activities that bond us. Right. right. Like these intense environments where there's a lot of extreme things happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you would think it would bring us very close together. And we do have, very, you know, most of us who, you know, like with our gay friends, we know very intimate details about them. We may have been intimate with them or witnessed things. But ultimately, we're not that close. Because then those same friends, it's like, well, I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable calling you on the phone and telling you I had a rough day. Mm -hmm. Right. Or needing a kind word. Right. There's, right? A, there's a certain level, there's a certain kind of vulnerability that is appropriate and, right. and some that is not. But so yeah. I thought this story did a good job of sort of, you know, touching on that amongst these friends. Um, oh. So the, the hot white guy who's like filming people to put on OnlyFans and then Charlie, the pediatrician Bowen likes. I thought they both, I thought it was fun casting that they both look very generic to me. Like they both look like Henry Cavill. I thought, Except one is like blonde and one's brunette. I thought Hugh Dancy for... Uh, or that. I mean, all these guys, you sure, know, yes. they, they all look the same. Mm -hmm. They all have the same body because they all are ripped and they all have the same floppy hair. And So I thought that was funny. Um, there's a scene where 
the characters say like, oh, underwear night is like the biggest night on Fire Island. Like everyone goes. That's when everyone's welcome. And so they're preparing. So we see them all in their little underwear. You see the Bo and, Lang, Bo and Yang's little ass. And then they all bring drugs to the table. <laughs> like they're all, Poppers yeah, and... they're all gathered around the dining room table before they go out to share whatever drugs they brought. A whole lot of G. There's some G, some K, some, uh, some random pill they don't know. Um, I thought that was cute. Like, cause, cause they don't have the resources to mm-hmm. have like a full stock. Mm-hmm. So they're just all like, this is what I have to offer. Uh, it is important to know the one character, the black guy Mm -hmm. um he seems to be the more like sensible one meeting reading madeline albright on the way but then he ends up taking something at the underwear night and getting super high so that was kind of funny um there's a scene where peppermint the drag queen Mm -hmm. so i want to take this moment to shout out peppermint did a recreation of janet jackson's video if oh yeah she sure did looks great and it's very impressive. Mm-hmm. If you like drag or Janet Jackson or both. Or I would, peppermint. Or peppermint. <laughs> yeah, if you like peppermint. But if you like peppermint, you've probably seen it. Sure. But yeah, her version of If, because she uses Janet Jackson's track. So it's it's Janet's song with peppermint dressed like her. Mm-hmm. I mean, I am so impressed. Yeah. But she's in the film playing like a drag queen on the island. And then there's a cute scene with Will. It's the first time we see him where he's not a dick. And he's sort of like dancing, trying to impress Joel Kim Booster. I thought that was really... And he's played by Conrad Ricamora from How to Get Away with Murder. Oh, I, okay. I, I, I came to warm up to him. I, sure. I saw what they were doing, and I think that there were some clunky moments, but I think that's forgivable, too, because in, in life there are clunky moments. Sure. So, uh... My last note is, so... Bowen Yang's character decides like he's going to leave the week early, mm-hmm. because... The love of his life has rejected him. But the pediatrician, his the guy he was in love with for two days, um, realizes that he's leaving. And so he tries to chase him not to leave, but it's too late. He's Bowen's already on the ferry going back. So Joel Kim Booster's character says, you better do something big and stupid if you want him back. Like John Cusack say anything. Is because, Bowen, because Bowen Yang says at one point, like he wants the rom-com sort mm-hmm. of shit. So I feel like what he did was not that big and stupid. They, no. they they just get a taxi to follow the ferry and then he stops him. But then when he gets, I thought the cutest part of that scene was when Charlie gets out of the boat, Joel Kimbo's like, you got to do something big and stupid. And Charlie goes, I love you. And they're like, oh no, too big, like, too stupid. too big, too stupid. And then he explains that he really likes him. Mm-hmm. And it's, he's it's, the smartest, sweetest guy he's ever met. Funniest guy. I thought that was sweet. Um, I, a couple, I mean, there there are a lot of things that it touches on, I think. Uh, um, and I like it when it's kind of doing that those things more in a more subtle manner. Like, uh, after uh, how he feels the rejection from Charlie, he goes to uh, the predatorial... Yeah. There's another white character we see who sort he's one of those like, are you Asian? What kind of Asian are you? Like clearly fetishizing He's fetishizing Asian them, men. yeah. But then like you were saying. But but he uh, Noah it's like saves him from that. He's like, Don't go don't, don't go with him and it's like Well, well because Bowen Yang's character feels rejected, he decides to run into the arms of this asshole. But and again, that that, that double edged sword, there's he knows he's exploiting him, but he's also uh, he knows that he will have something satisfied and that he's desirable to this person and kind of uh, examining uh, in a really uh, obvious but uh, notable way of, of how that mechanism works and how troubling it is. Yeah, there are so many things I related to. I also related to Margaret Cho's character because she's talking to Joe Kim Booster about Bowen. Like, you know, you you need to stop trying to like Fix your friend. He'll figure his shit out on his own. And then Joel is telling Margaret, like, girl, what do you know? And she's like, you know, I was your age once. Mm-hmm. And I was popping on the island. Like, you know, I've done a lot of things. And he's like, well, you've had a fabulous life. And she's like, that's because I only tell you the good stuff. But mm-hmm. I have a lot of bad shit that I've done and I've been through. And I kind of felt that a lot. 
I also and I thought that was a good scene. Yeah, and I like Margaret Cho in this, and she's uh, some good comic relief. But uh, I wish there had been a little more interiority for her as well. Sure. Like this, this because what does she get from all this? Like this woman that lives on this island. Like, do you have friends your own age? Do you do you have none? There are none that come to visit you. That like, do you have any romance? Because she says to Joel, like, I, like I know you guys just come out here to stay with me because like I have this house here, and he's like, no, we love you, and she's like, yeah, that's sweet, but seriously though. And yeah, I wanted to know more about her, but again, it's doing a lot. It just I had mentioned this in something else we recorded, because I just read this book called Sheila Levine is Dead and Living in New York mm-hmm. by Gail Parents, uh, and there's a whole chapter in that where this, this young, awkward Jewish girl goes with her friends to Fire Island, and the chapter in that really feels very similar to this in that level of rejection, and I had to laugh at the grocery store scene in this. Uh, because in that book, she has to. There's this awkward scene where she carries all these groceries to Fire Island because groceries are so. Yeah, crazy. there's a scene where they go to the gro- where the group of friends go to the grocery store because they're prepping for a dinner party, and there's this one grocery store and it's notoriously expensive, so they're complaining. And then they have this routine where they like dent cans to like get a discount, and that's actually how Joel Kim Booster meets the predatory white guy. Uh, one of the predatory white guys. One of them. Uh, and then, so the end is really Will and uh, Noah coming to this understanding that for right, this this is a, something we want to explore with each other right now. And uh, both rejecting kind of this notion of monogamy, monogamy and uh, how that's a heteronormative structure. Uh, and, and so I found that interesting, probably the most interesting element of uh, a finale that feels a bit too pat. Like I wanted to see them kind of reject this whole notion of having to uh, feed into Fire Island. Yeah, I, I also wish that, especially for Bowen, but also for Joel Kim Booster's character, because he seems so invested in this concept of going to Fire Island and having these experiences, I kind of wish it would have ended with them realizing that they don't need this. They can make their own memories. They need to foster the, 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 the real relationships, the real friendships that they might have. So it kind of ends in a cliche sort of way with, where, with Donna Summer's last dance play and they uh, do pay for Donna Summer but I like that as you were saying when we after we watched this it's very reminiscent of late 90s early 2000s queer films about groups of uh, gay characters like uh, the Broken Hearts Club for instance uh, and it struck me that we've come a long way at least in for some reason I always think of this movie but Making Love starring uh, Harry Hamlin and um that's because you like Harry Hamlin. I do like Harry Hamlin. I do. Yeah. <laughs> well, so does Lisa Renner. Uh, no, as a child, I really liked him. Um, I know, and I, know. I think Michael Ontkeen and Jacqueline Smith. But the end of that is, you know, that was a very big deal in 1982, and it was a huge flop. And uh, about these two men that that have this open relationship and how um, they are very tied into that idea of monogamy and that they have to to assimilate, they have to act just like straight people. Uh, so I like that there's this kind of gentle rejection of we can make it what we want to be. Uh, well, and also that this film feels so gay. Yes. Because I think a lot of modern queer cinema feels like they're taking sort of normal situations and normal environments and just transplanting homosexuals where heterosexuals would be and I think that there there is a space for that and it is cool to see and we don't always need everything to be like poppers and butt plugs but it is nice to see like just a lot of gay shit I mean that's partially why I like living in a big city is like being around a lot of gay people and from multiple perspectives right um there is you know some I mean there is there are some graphic ish scenes because we see like a couple like sex scenes, but they're not, they're, they're more played like as a joke. Yeah. Like Joel Kim Booster walks in on an orgy. So we see all these men having sex and then he's like trying to look for Bowen. So he's saying his name and all the guys stop having sex to like look over and go like, oh no, he's not here. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it just feels super gay. And I really like that. It, like you said, it does call back to the gay films I'd watch in college 20 plus years ago. That said, I, I did uh, feel like, you know, Joel Kim Booster is playing somebody that's kind of unlikable at first, but you, you come around, but I really like Bowen Yang. I think Bowen Yang is so cute and yeah. funny. Joel Kim Booster is obviously very handsome. He's I've seen him perform his stand-up before. He seems kind of like a dick, and he's kind of like that in this movie, like kind of full of himself. Uh, again, I think th- that's also maybe something lacking, is that there's a good scene between uh, with him and Bowen Yang where... Uh, Howie is saying, your rules don't work for me, and I really I don't think they work for you either. And 
he doesn't really have kind of that that self actualization yeah. epiphany of himself that maybe my approach to myself is also holding me back. Uh, but that was a good scene because I think many of us relate to, I mean, gay or straight, like you have friends and sometimes friends are kind of similar and then there's competition and mm-hmm. and then feeling like your friends are trying to boost you up and it's like can we get back to reality mm-hmm. like you're hot i'm not you have opportunities i don't stop telling me that i can rule the world like i can't like i can't do what you do so i like that bowen told joel that well yeah just overlooking how other people just being honest about how other people are approaching you and, and it's okay and finding the strength in that too It also made me feel like I just wish that I had like, you know, I don't have a lot of friends and it it, sometimes it feels like it's hard to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It is. I don't know that I need to be so vulnerable. I'm not, you know, what we were talking about earlier is I think a lot of people don't, they're afraid to actually like share their true feelings. So it's hard to get the work done when you spend so much of your time pretending everything's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the sense I got from this group of friends. And maybe that's why the person who wrote it didn't want to give more interiority because it does feel like authentic that many of us on a social level are very superficial because it's almost like a faux pas to be because we all talk shit about the people who share too much and it's too like, much well, right away well yes. you feel that way because you're not really connecting with this person right. but if you liked them you would be very open to it well the act of being you know the the work of being an actual friend to somebody goes beyond hedonism and pleasure and i think that's why uh there's a certain characteristic of gay male friend groups that are are very specific to that realm because it 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 forces us to stay uh on that level when really what require the requirement is that vulnerability and getting to know people more than beyond what they can do for you in the moment what would you give this film uh three and a half I would give it three and a half as well. I would definitely recommend it. Mm -hmm. Don't forget the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.